Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today to talk about my most anticipated book releases for the rest of 2023. I did a video in January where I talked about my most anticipated 2023 releases. Most of those have been released. I think there were four on that list that are still to come. I included them in this list just because they are still upcoming and I am still excited about all of them. But uh, for the most part, these are books that have been announced since then and are coming out and I'm really excited. This is a mix of fiction and nonfiction, although it is overwhelmingly fiction. I should say there's a, a majority of fiction titles. And the reason for that is simple. I tend to read mostly fiction. But I picked 20 books that are coming out in the latter part of 2023. I'm really excited about these books. I hope you will be as well. I encourage you to pre-order any book that sounds interesting to you because in the current publishing landscape, not to lecture you, pre-orders are very important, especially for smaller titles. So we're going to talk about Jessamyn Ward, obviously. She's going to be fine if people don't pre-order her book all that much, although it does help her publisher get an idea of what volume of copies they might need to print initially. But for the smaller authors, the smaller books, and the smaller publishers, it really does matter because that's where you can really move the needle by showing interest in one of these books. You can also share them on social media, things like that, talk about them, and that will kind of let the publisher know, oh, there's excitement for this. So pre-order with an independent bookstore, I would say. So again, I just encourage you, pre-order these books with an independent bookstore or on bookshop.org. I will have the links to all of these books on Bookshop down below. Bookshop.org supports independent bookstores. So it's a great alternative to that other internet company that I won't talk about here. <laughs> I should also add that I am going to be doing another video, hopefully later this week, where I talk about some other books that are coming in the latter part of 2023 that I'm a little less sure of, but could potentially be interested in. So stay tuned for that. But again, I have selected 20 titles. Let's dive in and start talking about them. I'm going to talk about them in order of their release date. So the books I talk about first are the ones that will be coming first. And then the books that I talk about last are the ones that are coming out furthest away in the calendar year, and so on. The first one is going to be released next week as I'm filming this, uh, but it will be this week as this video is published. <laughs> it's going to be released on July 4th, 2023. It's The Librarianist by Patrick DeWitt. I have not read a book other than The Sisters Brothers by Patrick DeWitt, but I was a big fan of that book, and I've always been kind of curious by some of his other releases. This one sounds interesting. Here is the blurb from online. Bob Comet is a retired librarian passing his solitary days surrounded by books and small comforts in a mint-colored house in Portland, Oregon. One morning on his daily walk, he encounters a confused elderly woman lost in a market and returns her to the senior center that is her home. Hoping to fill the void he's known since retiring, he begins volunteering at the center. Here, as a community of strange peers gathers around Bob and following a happenstance brushed with a painful complication from his past, the events of his life and the details of his character are revealed. Behind Bob Comet's straight man facade is the story of an unhappy child's runaway adventure during the last days of the Second World War, of true love won and stolen away of the purpose and pride found in the librarian's vocation and the pleasure of a life lived to the side of the masses. Bob's experiences are imbued with melancholy, but also a bright, sustained comedy. He has a talent for locating bizarre and outsized players to welcome onto the stage of his life. With his inimitable verve, skewed humor, and compassion for the outcast, Patrick DeWitt has written a wide-ranging and ambitious document of the introvert's condition. The librarianist celebrates the extraordinary in the so-called ordinary life and depicts beautifully the turbulence that sometimes exists beneath a surface of serenity. I think that sounds really interesting. And again, this one is going to be coming out the week that this video is released. So in this case, pre-ordering won't help you, but you could check your local library, see if they have a copy, or check your local indie and see if they have a copy. This is published by Echo Press, by the way. I really enjoyed The Sisters Brothers, and I know a lot of other people have. So if you've been looking for something else to read by Patrick DeWitt, maybe this is a good excuse to finally get around to doing that. The next one is a book that I had not heard of at all until I started looking into this, and it will be released on July 11th. So again, 
when I publish this video, it's coming pretty fast. It's the Holy Days of Gregorio Passos by Rodrigo Restrepo Montoya. And for this one, I'm going to read the review from Kirkus because I feel like that really captures why I found this interesting. This tender debut novel follows Gregorio Passos, a 21-year-old Colombian-American who's prone to injury. The novel opens just after his third hospitalizing soccer injury, which forces him to spend a month in recovery. During that time, he sleeps, dreams, and narrates a life of many different injuries as an immigrant. As the child of divorced parents and of both Colombia and the United States, Gregorio grew up with a constant feeling of being divided. Rather than situate Gregorio's coming of age on either continent, the novel draws parallels between Colombia's violent history and the United States under Trump's presidency. These parallels are written in impactful prose that feels weighted with grief. Early on, Gregorio laments how easy it was to die in Colombia and how little one could do about it. On the other hand, how strange it was to live in a town where people's biggest threats seemed to be themselves. In spite of its constant sense of dread of waiting for another bomb or gun to go off, the novel is surprisingly tender and warm. Through each of his injuries, Gregorio develops close re relationships with his uncle Nico, who has cancer, Magdalena, his landlady, who dies shortly after the 2016 election, and others. Gregorio is haunted by the past, but the author shows that ghosts aren't scary when a person is enmeshed in their community. Emboldened by the lessons of the past and present, Gregorio develops a more confident voice. Written in a series of short, vivid chapters, this is an accessible and smooth read. The first-person voice hardly changes tone and style, even in chapters narrated by characters other than Gregorio. Restrepo Montoya walks a fine line between scathing and maudlin and invites readers to listen in on the conversations that happen between families in times of conflict. A captivating, complicated take on coming of age. So much about that sounds really interesting. You have the idea of framing a story through injuries and the sort of division between Colombia and the United States. I have really resisted books that really delve into complications of the Trump presidency because it just enrages me right now, but this seems like a good way to sort of tiptoe into those waters. Really sounds good and exciting. This is published by $2 Radio, so this is one of those smaller publishers that you might want to think about supporting. I, I just think it sounds really interesting, and I hope you think so as well. Then we have Crook Manifesto by Colson Whitehead. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time because the description of this online is really long, and I have this is one of the ones that was in my January most anticipated books of 2023. So again, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. What I will say is that this is published by Doubleday Books, and it is a sort of sequel to Harlem Shuffle, which was Colson Whitehead's last book, and it sort of moves the story from the 1960s in Harlem to the 1970s. So we're sort of moving into um, later years. Uh, it still uses the form of a crime novel to examine larger issues. Here's a quick quote about the book from the description. A darkly funny tale of a city under siege, but also a sneakily searching portrait of the meaning of family. Colson Whitehead's kaleidoscopic portrait of Harlem is sure to stand as one of the all-time great evocations of a place and a time. Colson Whitehead is a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Only four people have done that. He did it for Underground Railroad and the Nickel Boys. So every time he publishes a book, it is a landmark event. And this will be published on July 18th. So it's coming up quickly. Then we have another book that I actually talked about in that January most anticipated one, but it's Disruptions, which are, it's a story collection by Stephen Milhauser, who is another author who has won a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. However, his is, I would say, significantly less known than Colson Whitehead's, not just because Colson Whitehead's were, Colson Whitehead has two, but they were really recent. But I think uh, Stephen Milhauser won for a book called Martin Dressler that people just don't really talk about. It will be interesting to read it as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. The only book of Stephen Milhauser's that I have read is called Dangerous Laughter, and it was published at some time in the mid to late aughts. And I really liked it a lot. It's kind of bizarre and surreal in a lot of ways. I don't remember a lot of details about those stories. But I do remember that I was really impressed with Stephen Milhauser as a writer, and I've wanted to explore his work more. I'm looking forward to getting to him as part of the Pulitzer Prize project, but this also sounds really intriguing to me. And this has a very short description online, so I will read that. 
Here are 18 stories of astonishing rage and precision. A housewife drinks alone in her Connecticut living room. A guillotine glimmers above a sleepy town green. A pre-recorded customer service message sends a caller into a reverie of unspeakable yearning. With a deft touch and funhouse mirror perspective, for which he has won countless admirers, Stephen Milhauser gives us the towns, marriages, and families of a quintessential American lifestyle that is at once instantly recognizable and profoundly unsettling. Disruptions is a collection of provocative, bracingly original new work from a writer at the peak of his form. It will be published by Knopf on August 1st. So, coming up, by the time this video publishes, it will be like less than a month away. So, uh, again, think about pre-ordering or check to see if your library is going get, to be getting a copy by this point. Hopefully, they would know if they are or not. And that takes us to Witness, another story collection by Jamel Brinkley. I know a lot of people are iffy on story collections, but I love them, so I'm including them in my most anticipated, and you're just gonna have to deal with it. And, you know, maybe this is also me challenging people to maybe think about reading more story collections as well. This book will be published by FSG on August 1st as well. Here is what it says about it in the description. What does it mean to take action? To bear witness, what does it cost? In these 10 stories, each set in the changing landscapes of contemporary New York City, a range of characters, from children to grandmothers to ghosts, live through the responsibility of perceiving and the moral challenge of speaking up or taking action. Though they strive to connect, to remember, to stand up for, and to really see each other, they often fall short, and the structures they build around these ambitions and failures shape not only their own futures, but the legacies and prospects of their families and their city. In its portraits of families and friendships lost and found, the paradox of intimacy, the long shadow of grief, the meaning of home, witness enacts its own testimony. Here is a world where fortunes can be made and stolen in just a few generations, where strangers might sometimes show kindness while those we trust, doctors, employers, siblings, too often turn away, where joy comes in snatches, flowers on a windowsill, dancing in the street, glimpsing your purpose, change on the horizon. With prose as upendingly beautiful as it is artfully, seamlessly crafted, Jamel Brinkley offers nothing less than the full scope of life and death and change in the great unending drama of the city. Sounds really interesting to me, and FSG is a pretty reliable publisher, so I feel pretty confident that this is something that I would enjoy, and hopefully you feel the same about that. Then we have a pretty well-established author, James McBride. This is the Heaven and Earth Grocery Store. The Good Lord Bird is an absolutely fantastic book. I would argue that it should have won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in the year in which it was published. Unfortunately, it was not even a finalist for it. I was not as much of a fan of Deacon King Kong, but it actually was my prediction to win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction the year in which it was published. That didn't pan out, um, but I really enjoy James McBride as an author, and of course, anytime he releases a new book, first of all, I'm going to be interested, and second, my Pulitzer-minded brain is immediately going to start spinning and considering possibilities and odds for whether or not this could be the book that will get him across the finish line. Here's the description. In 1972, when workers in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, were digging the foundations for a new development, the last thing they expected to find was a skeleton at the bottom of a well. Who the skeleton was and how it got there were two of the long-held secrets kept by the residents of Chicken Hill, the dilapidated neighborhood where immigrant Jews and African Americans lived side by side and shared ambitions and sorrows. Chicken Hill was where Moishe and Chona Ludlow lived when Moishe integrated his theater and when Chona ran the Heaven and Earth grocery store. When the state came looking for a deaf boy to institutionalize him, it was Chona and Nate Timblin, the black janitor at Moishe's theater and the unofficial leader of the black community on Chicken Hill, who worked together to keep the boys safe. As these characters' stories overlap and deepen, it becomes clear how much the people who live on the margins of white Christian America struggle and what they must do to survive. When the truth is finally revealed about what happened on Chicken Hill and the part the town's white establishment played in it, McBride shows us that even in dark times, it is love and community, heaven and earth, that sustain us. 
bringing his masterly storytelling skills and his deep faith in humanity to the heaven and earth grocery store, James McBride has written a novel as compassionate as Deacon King Kong and as inventive as The Good Lord Bird. Again, I love The Good Lord Bird, so that is really good to hear. And I think that last part really clarifies why I'm always so interested in James McBride books, that he uses his storytelling skills and his deep faith in humanity. If you follow along, you know I'm a huge fan of Barbara Kingsolver. I was really happy that Demon Copperhead won. And the thing I always talk about with that book is her compassion and her empathy. So I think that is definitely something I'm learning about myself as a reader. I really appreciate stories that are sort of compassionate and maybe are critical and uncompromising in their view of humanity, but also have hope and faith and compassion that we could potentially do better. I think that kind of sums up my hope. <laughs> uh, it's the outlook on the world that I aspire to, let's say. So perhaps it's not all that surprising that I respond to it. That is going to be published on August 8th. I don't think I mentioned who the publisher is. It is Riverhead Books. So another one to check out for sure. Then a book I'm really, really excited about. Dearborn by Ghassan Zenadine made me do something I have not really done all that much since I started a booktube channel. Uh, actually, not at all, really. I reached out to the publisher and asked for a review copy. That's how interested in this book I am. The publisher, by the way, is Tin House Books. Tin House Books published Night of the Living Res by Morgan Salty, which you may remember, was one of my favorite reads from last year, and I have been obsessively talking about it ever since. So as I was putting this list together, I was kind of keeping a an eye on Tin House Books and their list, and this one jumped out the hardest to me. Here is the description of it. Oh, by the way, they uh, did accept my um, request for a review copy. I don't have it right now, but I am so excited to get it and to talk about this book and review it. I hope I like it. <laughs> we'll find out. But uh, here is the description. Spanning several decades, Ghassan Zenadine's debut collection examines the diverse range and complexities of the Arab American community in Dearborn, Michigan. In 10 tragicomic stories, Zenadine explores themes of identity, generational conflicts, war trauma, migration, sexuality, queerness, home and belonging, and more. That is like a checklist for everything that immediately grabs my attention in a book. Seriously, you can't do much better than that. In Dearborn, a father teaches his son how to cheat the IRS and hide their cash earnings inside of frozen chickens. Tensions heighten within a close-knit group of couples when a mysterious man begins to frequent the local gym pool, dressed in speedos printed with nostalgic images of Lebanon. And a failed stage actor attempts to drive a young Lebanese man with ambitions of becoming a Hollywood action hero to L.A., but immigration and customs enforcement agents have other plans. By turns wildly funny, incisive, and deeply moving, Dearborn introduces readers to an arresting new voice in contemporary fiction and invites us all to consider what it means to be part of a place and community and how it is that we help one another survive. Again, that description is like catnip for me. And I know, again, people are a little wary of short stories. I'm all in on it. And I think the fact that this really captures the neighborhood... Uh, so interesting. I have also finished the new season of Padma Lakshmi's Taste the Nation recently, and there is an episode that talks about the Middle Eastern community in Dearborn, Michigan, and how they got there and how they keep their traditions and cultures alive over the years. And that was a really interesting episode. And the fact that now this book was on a list of titles I was looking at immediately made me interested. And I'm just so excited. This is going to be published on September 5th. So again, I'm going to encourage you, uh, if you, this sounds interesting to you, pre-order a copy, think about it, and uh, yeah, check it out. I'm so excited to read it. I can't wait to uh, get the review copy of it. Now we have a big one for the year, and this is something that I had mentioned in my January most anticipated video as well, although I don't think there were many details about the book at the time. It's The Vaster Wilds by Lauren Groff. It is going to be published on September 12th by Riverhead Books. I am a huge fan of Matrix, Lauren Groff's last book, so I'm really excited about this. Here's what they say. 
a taut and electrifying novel from celebrated best-selling author Lauren Groff about one spirited girl alone in the wilderness trying to survive. A servant girl escapes from a colonial settlement in the wilderness. She carries nothing with her but her wits, a few possessions, and the spark of God that burns hot within her. What she finds in this terra incognita is beyond the limits of her imagination and will bend her belief in everything that her own civilization has taught her. Lauren Groff's new novel is at once a thrilling adventure story and a penetrating fable about trying to find a way of living in a world succumbing to the churn of colonialism. The Vaster Wilds is a work of raw and prophetic power that tells the story of America in miniature, through one girl at a hinge point in history to ask how and if we can adapt quickly enough to save ourselves. I mean, <laughs> that sounds so good. And I, again, I just loved Matrix, so I'm really looking forward to this, and I hope it lives up to the amount of expectation that I have put on it. Again, it will be published by Riverhead Books on September 12th. That takes us to another book you probably haven't heard of, because I hadn't heard of it. Uh, an author you probably haven't heard of, because I hadn't heard of her. It's called Good Women. It's another story collection by Hallie Hill. It is going to be published by Hub City Press on September 12th. 2023. Here is the description. In her dynamic debut, Hallie Hill's Good Women delves into the lives of 12 black women across the Appalachian South. A woman boards a Greyhound bus barreling towards Florida to meet her sugar daddy's mother. A state fair employee considers revenge on a local preacher. A sister struggles with guilt as she helps her brother plan to run away with a man he's been seeing in secret. A young woman who works for a scam for profit college navigates the lies she sells for a living. Darkly funny and deeply human, Good Women observes how place, blood ties, generational trauma, obsession, and boundaries, or lack thereof, influence how we navigate our small worlds and how those worlds so often collide in ways we don't expect. Again, this is like catnip for me as a reader. Through intimate moments of personal choice, Hill carefully shines a light on how these 12 women shape and form themselves through faith and abandon, transgression and conformity, community, caution, and solitude. With precision and empathy, Hill captures the mundane in moments of absurdity and bears witness to both joy and heartbreak, reminding us how the next moment could be life-changing. Vibrant and exacting, Hill is a must-read new voice in literary fiction. Again, that description is catnip for me. This will be published on September 12th, 2023. Hub City Press is a smaller and more independent publisher. Definitely someone I would recommend supporting uh, because they do a lot of really interesting books every year. They actually published The Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles, which is a book that I read and loved, even though it emotionally devastated me. So I just encourage you to check this one out. I think it sounds absolutely fascinating and I can't wait to read it. Now we have a new book, or at least a new book published in English from Annie Ernaux, The Young Man. It is translated by Alison Strayer. It will be published on September 12th. September 12th is a big day for publishing, by the way, and it is coming from Seven Stories Press. Annie Ernaux won the Nobel Prize for Literature last year. I'll put my reaction down below. I listened to her book Happening on audio last year, and it was my favorite nonfiction book of 2022. It was staggering and powerful and really, if you are uncertain about whether or not she deserved a Nobel Prize for literature, read Happening. You'll get it. Here's the description of this one. Annie Ernaux's most recent book, Dazzling and Breathtaking, published in France in 2022, is about her affair with a man 30 years her junior. The young man is Annie Ernaux's account of her passionate love affair with A, a man some 30 years younger when she was in her 50s. The relationship pulls her back to memories of her own youth and at the same time leaves her feeling ageless, outside of time, together with the sense that she is living her life backwards. Amidst talk of having a child together, she feels time running its course and menopause approaching. The young man recalls Erno as the scandalous girl she once was, but is composed with the mastery and self-assurance she has achieved across decades of writing. And again, it comes from Seven Stories Press. It's a short little thing. It's 64 pages, but it sounds fascinating, and it will be released on September 12th. And I loved Happening so much that I have been almost desperate to read something else by Annie Erno, and it just sounds like a good one. Now, in a break from 
you know, traditional nonfiction or fiction, we have a graphic memoir, This Country, Searching for Home in Very Rural America by Navid Madavian. This will be published on September 12th. Again, September 12th is a big day for publishing this year, and it is coming from Princeton Architectural Press. Before David Madavian moved his wife and dog in November of 2016 from San Francisco to an off-the-grid cabin in rural Idaho, he had never fished, gardened, hiked, hunted, or lived in a snowy place. But there, he could own land, realize his dream of being an artist, and start a family, the millennial dream. Over the next three years, Madavian learned, leaned into the wonders of the natural Idaho landscape and found himself adjusting to and enjoying a slower pace of living. But beyond the boundaries of his six acres, he was confronted with the realities of America's political shifts and forced to confront the question, do I belong here? Madavian's beautifully written and unflinchingly honest graphic memoir charts his growth and struggles as an artist, citizen, and new father. It celebrates his love of place and honors the relationships he makes in rural America, touching on dynamics like culture, environment, and identity in America, and even articulating difficult moments of racism and brutality he found there as a Middle Eastern American. With wit, compassion, and a sense of humor, Madavian's insider perspective offers a unique portrait of one of the most remote and wild areas of the American West. I live very close to the Idaho border. I'm obviously on the Montana side. I haven't spent a whole lot of time in Idaho, but it is a very complicated place. And I say that as someone who lives in a state that is also a very complicated place. So this sounds really interesting to me. And uh, I am a fan of graphic memoirs and graphic novels. So I I've struggled with some recently, but because they seem a little superficial. This does not sound like it would fall into that trap. This sounds like it's going to give you the full story. And I really think it sounds interesting. Again, Princeton Architecture. Architectural Press is the publisher, and it will be released on September 12th. That takes us to <laughs> the first one in a while that is not published on September 12th. It's a week later. The title is Loved and Missed by Susie Boyt. It is going to be published by New York Review of Books on September 19th. Here is the description. With her daughter in the throes of drug addiction, a mother takes over the care of her granddaughter and is transformed by the bond that forms between them. In this warm, sharp-witted, and psychologically astute story of familial love by a praised British novelist. Ruth is a woman who believes in and despairs of the curative power of love. Her daughter Eleanor is a drug addict who has just had a baby, Lily. Ruth adjusts herself in large ways and small to give to Eleanor what she thinks she may need. Nourishment, distance, affection. But all her gifts fall short. What Eleanor wants is only what will mutilate. When Ruth finds a body, the victim of an overdose in Eleanor's apartment, she gives her a large envelope of cash in exchange for Lily and takes the baby home. She wonders how her friends see her. No matter, Lily is a life force, and as she grows, her benevolent presence begins to soften the sharp-edged defeats and disappointments that have menaced Ruth for so long. For a person left by people all her life, love without fear is an almost unrecognizable feeling, and will it last? Loved and Missed is a whip-smart, incisive, and mordantly witty novel about love, love's gains and missteps. British writer Susie Boyd's seventh novel, and the first to be published in the U.S., is a triumph sounds a little difficult, a little painful, but beautiful and maybe hopeful. Uh, I love stories about people healing from things that have hurt or damaged them in the past. So it just sounds really interesting to me and I can't wait for it. Again, it will be published on September 19th. Now we get to Beyond the Door of No Return by David Diop. Or Diop. I, I, I apologize. I actually did not look up how to pronounce his name, but it is translated by Sam Taylor. This is an author who I believe won the International Booker Prize. Yeah, he won the International Booker Prize. So he's someone who's been on my radar, but the book that he won the International Booker for, I've been curious, but I've also been very nervous because people talk about it being very, very brutal, and I don't know that I'm up for that right now. So this one sounds much more accessible for me at this point in time. Here we go. Paris, 1806. The renowned botanist Michael Adamson lies on his deathbed, hid the masterwork to which he dedicated his life still incomplete. As he expires, the last word to escape his lips is a woman's name, Maram. 
The key to this mysterious woman's identity is Adanson's unpublished memoir of the years he spent in Senegal, concealed in a secret compartment in a chest of drawers. Therein lies a story as fantastical as it is tragic. Maram, it turns out, is none other than the fabled Revenant, a young woman of noble birth from the kingdom of Wallow. Maram was sold into slavery but managed to escape from the island of Goree, a major embarkation point of the transatlantic slave trade, to a small village hidden in the forest. While on a research expedition in West Africa as a young man, Adanson hears the story of the Revenant and becomes obsessed with finding her. Accompl accompanied by his guide, he ventures deep into the Senegalese bush on a journey that reveals not only the savagery of the French colonial occupation, but also the unlikely transports of the human heart. Written with sensitivity and narrative flair, David Dyeff's Beyond the Door of No Return is a love story like few others. Drawing on the richness and lyricism of Senegal's oral traditions, Dyeff has constructed a historical epic of the highest order. Interestingly, reading through that this time and talking about the savagery, it does make me just a little concerned that it will be as brutal as his last book. And so maybe for that, I, I might wait for a little bit of feedback, but it sounds fascinating. He remains an author that I am hoping to get to at some point in the future. It's just the brutality is the only thing that makes me think maybe it's going to be down the line and not now. This is published by FSG and it will be released on September 19th. The next book is also released on September 19th. This one coming from Knopf. It's Night Watch by Jane Ann Phillips. In 1874, in the wake of the war, erasure, trauma, and namelessness haunt civilians and veterans, renegades and wanderers, freedmen and runaways. Twelve-year-old Connolly, the adult in her family for as long as she can remember, finds herself on a buckboard journey with her mother Eliza, who hasn't spoken in more than a year. They arrive at the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum in West Virginia, delivered to the hospital's entrance by a war veteran who has forced himself into their world. There, far from family, a beloved neighbor, and the mountain home they know, tr they try to reclaim their lives. The omnipresent vagaries of war and race rise to the surface as we learn their story. Their flight to the highest mountain ridges of western Virginia, the disappearance of Connolly's father who left for the war and never returned. Meanwhile, in the asylum, they begin to find a new path. Connolly pretends to be her mother's maid. Eliza responds slowly to treatment. They get swept up in the life of the facility, the mysterious man they call the Night Watch, the orphan child called Weed, the fearsome woman who runs the kitchen, the remarkable doctor at the head of the institution. Epic, enthralling, and meticulously crafted, Night Watch is a brilliant portrait of family endurance against all odds and a stunning chronicle of surviving war and its aftermath. Again, that will be published by Knopf on September 19th. I have never read a book by Jane Ann Phillips. I believe she wrote the book Lark and Termite, which I have heard good things about. I've just never gotten around to reading it, and this sounds like a really interesting book. I saw a review of it that kind of points out that there was a time when sort of lunatic asylums were very different from what we think of historically. Like, maybe this is actually a place that really did try to help people get healthy. Uh, that will be another interesting thing to look into as the book approaches. Next, we have a new novel from a Booker Prize winning author, Anne Enright. The title is The Wren, The Wren, and this will be published by W.W. W. Norton and Company on September 19th. Again, September is a big month. September 12th has a lot. September 19th has a lot. Here is the description. Nell McDara never knew her grandfather, the celebrated Irish poet Phil McDara, but his love poems seem to speak directly to her. Restless and wryly self-assured, at 22, Nell leaves her mother, Carmel's orderly home to find her own voice as a writer, mostly online, ghost blogging for an influencer, and to live a poetical life. As she chases down obsessive love, damage, and transcendence in Dublin and beyond, her grandfather's poetry seems to guide her home. Nell's mother, Carmel McDara, knows the magic of her dado's po poetry too well, the kind of magic that makes women in their 90s slip outside for a kiss and then elope, as her mother Terry had done. In his poems to Carmel, Phil envisions his daughter as a bright-eyed wren ascending in escape from his hand, but it is Phil who departs, abandoning his wife and two daughters. Carmel struggles to reconcile the poet with the father whose desertion scarred her life, along with that of her fiercely dutiful sister and their gentle cancer-ridden mother. To distance herself from this betrayal, Carmel turns inward, raising Nell, her daughter, and one trusted love alone. 
The Wren the Wren brings to life three generations of McDarrow women who must contend with inheritance, of poetic wonder, and of abandonment by a man who is lauded in public and carelessly selfish at home. Their other, stronger inheritance is a sustaining love that is more than a strand of DNA, but a rope thrown from the past, a fat, twisted rope full of blood. In sharp prose studded with crystalline poetry, Anne Enright masterfully braids a family story of longing, betrayal, and hope. And again, this is going to be published by Norton and Company on September 19th. I have still not read an Anne Enright book, and I really, really need to get around to it. I believe The Gathering is the book that she won the Booker Prize for, and she released a book recently called Actress that I was interested in and just for whatever reason never got around to reading. So this feels like uh, an urgent book for me to get to because if you follow along, you know I love complicated family stories. I love generational trauma and everything like that. So this book really calls to me in a very interesting way. Now we have This is Salvaged, stories by Vahini Vara. Vahini Vara is notable because they were the only Pulitzer Prize finalist this year. The other two books that were named as finalists both co-won the prize, Demon Copperhead and Trust. So I have not read The Immortal King Rao, which is the book that Vahini Vara was finalist for, um, but I've heard really good things about it. And this one is going to be released again by W.W. W. Norton and Company on September 26th. Here's the description. Pushing intimacy to its limits in prose of unearthly beauty, Vahini Vara explores the nature of being a child, parent, friend, sibling, neighbor, or lover, and the relationships between self and others. A young girl reads the encyclopedia to her elderly neighbor, who is descending into dementia. A pair of teenagers seek intimacy as phone sex operators. A competitive sibling tries to rise above the drunken mess of her own life to become a loving aunt. One sister consumes the ashes of another, and in the title story, an experimental artist takes on his most ambitious project yet, constructing a life-size ark according to the Bible's specifications. In a world defined by estrangement, where is communion to be found? The characters in This is Salvaged, unmoored in turbulence, and searching fervently for meaning through one another. Again, that will be published on September 26th. It sounds fascinating. So at some point, I need to catch up to either the Immortal King Rao or this is salvaged. Then we get to one of the books I'm most excited about this year, which is Roman Stories from Jhumpa Lahiri. I've read every fiction book that Jhumpa Lahiri has published. Interpreter of Maladies is one of my favorite books, and I am really looking forward to this. It is going to be published by Knopf on October 10th. Here is the description. Rome, metropolis and monument, suspended between past and future, multifaceted and metaphysical, is the protagonist, not the setting, of these nine stories, the first short story collection by the Pulitzer Prize winning master of the form since her number one New York Times bestseller, Unaccustomed Earth, and a major literary event. In the boundary, one family vacations in the Roman countryside, though we see their lives through the eyes of the caretaker's daughter, who nurses a wound from her family's immigrant past. In Pease Parties, a Roman couple, now empty nesters, finds comfort and community with foreigners at their friend's yearly birthday gathering, until the husband crosses a line. And in the steps, on a public staircase that connects two neighborhoods and the residents who climb up and down it, we see Italy's capital in all of its social and cultural variegations, filled with the tensions of a changing city, visibility and invisibility, random acts of aggression, the challenge of straddling worlds and cultures, and the meaning of home. These are splendid searching stories written in Jhumpa Lahiri's adopted language of Italian and seamlessly translated by the author and Knopf editor Todd Portnowitz. Stories steeped in the moods of Italian master Alberto Moravia and guided in the concluding tale by the ineluctable ghost of Dante Alighieri, whose words lead the protagonist toward a new way of life. I'm a huge fan of Jhumpa Lahiri. She's had such an interesting career. And this sort of Italian phase, I don't want to call it a phase, it, but this evolution that she's undergoing, I find fascinating. I, I think whereabouts is, I loved it. I, I know there have been people who did not respond to it the way that I did, but I thought it was such a fascinating book. And I'm very curious to see what she does with Roman stories. Then we have another book that I am really, really looking forward to. And I actually just got access to it on NetGalley. So I'm hoping that I will be able to read it in early July. Let Us Descend by Jessman Ward. This will be published on October 24th from Scribner. I have said that Jessman Ward 
has set herself up. I believe that she it's only a matter of time before she wins a Pulitzer Prize for fiction. This could be the one that finally gets her there. I honestly think she should have won for Sing Unburied Sing. She didn't. It's a whole thing with me. We won't get into it here. But I'm really looking forward to this book. I loved Sing Unburied Sing. I loved Salvage the Bones. And I met her briefly once, kind of in a group of people when I was still working in publishing, and she was just a lovely person. So that really makes a difference. Let Us Descend is a reimagining of American slavery as beautifully rendered as it is heart-wrenching. Searching, harrowing, replete with transcendent love, the novel is a journey from the rice fields of the Carolinas to the slave markets of New Orleans and into the fearsome heart of a Louisiana sugar plantation. Annis, sold south by the white enslaver who fathered her, is the reader's guide through this hillscape. As she struggles through the miles-long march, Annis turns inward, seeking comfort from the memories of her mother and stories of her African warrior grandmother. Throughout, she opens herself to a world beyond this world, one teeming with spirits of earth and water, of myth and history, spirits who nurture and give, and those who manipulate and take. While Ward leads readers through the descent, this, her fourth novel, is ultimately a story of rebirth and reclamation. From one of the most singularly brilliant and beloved writers of her generation, this miracle of a novel inscribes Black American grief and joy into the very land, the rich but unforgiving forests, swamps, and rivers of the American South. Let Us Descend is Jessamyn Ward's most magnificent novel yet, a masterwork for the ages. And again, it comes from Scribner on October 24th. I am so excited about this book. I can't even tell you. I have hyped myself up for it to a frankly ludicrous degree. I just want good things for Jessamyn Ward. I've really wanted good things for her in the past. And I hope that this is the book that will help her get more good things. I, I, I think she deserves it, although I haven't read the book yet. Hopefully it will live up to all of this hype. Then we have two more books. The next one is a nonfiction title, To Free the Captives, A Plea for the American Soul by Tracy K. Smith. This is coming from Knopf on November 7th. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet and this is a stunning meditation on memory, family, and history that explores how we in America might together come to a new view of our shared past. In 2020, heartsick from constant assaults on Black life, Tracy K. Smith found herself soul-searching and digging into the historical archive for help navigating the din of human division and strife. With lyricism and urgency, Smith draws on several avenues of thinking personal, documentary, and spiritual to understand who we are as a nation and what we might hope to mean to one another. To Free the Captives begins this journey by assembling a new terminology of American life, parsing the difference between the free and the freed and the distance between time ago and soon, Smith etches a portrait of where we find ourselves 400 years into the American experiment and offers a compelling argument for the vocabulary of the soul as a tool for fulfilling our duties to each other and to the future. I mean, that sounds really good and very interesting. Prime candidate for me to listen to on audio it is coming from Knopf on November 7th. And again, it just sounds really compelling. Now, we get to the final book in my most anticipated books from the second half of 2023. It's The End of the World is a Cul-de-Sac, a story collection from Louise Kennedy. Louise Kennedy made it onto the Women's Prize shortlist for her debut novel, Trespasses, which, which I read and loved, but seems to be a bit of a cilantro book. A lot of people read it and didn't respond to it in the same way that I did. I thought it was absolutely fantastic, and I can't wait to read something else. So I was really excited when I saw that she had a new book coming, and I, I love short stories, so so I was even more excited when I saw that it is a collection of stories. Here's the description. Oh, this is coming from Riverhead on December 5th. In these visceral, stunningly crafted stories by the author of the much-acclaimed Trespasses, women's lives are etched by poverty, material, emotional, and sexual, but also splashed by beauty, sometimes even joy, as they search for the good in the cards they've been dealt. A wife is abandoned by her new husband in a derelict housing estate with blood on her hands. An expectant mother's worst fears about her husband's entanglement with a teenage girl are confirmed. A sister is tormented by visions of the man her brother murdered during the Troubles. A woman struggles to forgive herself after an abortion threatens to destroy her marriage. Plumbing the depths of intimacy, violence, and redemption, these stories are, quote, dazzling, heartbreaking, keen to share the lessons of a lifetime. That's a quote from The Guardian. 
I really enjoyed Trespasses again, so I am really looking forward to reading more from Louise Kennedy. I'm just so glad that we're getting it so quickly. I, I hope that the quality lives up to Trespasses and that this isn't something that they're just kind of rushing out to uh, capitalize on her early success. Really looking forward to it. Again, it's The End of the World as a Cul-de-Sac coming by, from Riverhead on December 5th. And there you have it. Those are the 20 books that I am most looking forward to in the latter part of 2023. I, I will, again, be coming with some books I'm a little less sure of uh, later this week. Stay tuned for that. And if you've made it to this point in the video, I really appreciate your time. I am always appreciative of that. And I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.